with um, experienced technical managers to review the information. And so it's kind of a check and balance. If we didn't get all the information presented to us, perhaps in the mission management team, we have a check and balance that says, did the, did the right technical work get done? Was it reviewed by the appropriate technical management? And do they agree? And so we, so we have a check and balance system going that says in both cases, in case we miss something one way or the other, the combination of the process will allow us to be satisfied that we work through the process properly. Elliot Kleinberg, Palm Beach Post. How therapeutic was it for everybody to come back to work today after, uh, I'll talk about here at the Space Center after such a, a wrenching weekend, and when will you decide the pace at which you're going to continue on the two orbiters, or if you're going to stop it while you investigate? I haven't talked to a lot of people and asked them the question, how do they feel? Let me give you some personal experience. As long as I'm at work, as long as I'm focused on the job that I have to do, as long as I'm reviewing data or reviewing the results of teams, I can stay pretty well focused on what I need to do. The hardest thing that I've had to do over the past two days was drive home in my car Saturday afternoon alone with my own thoughts. I've talked to several others that had the same experience. As long as we are together, as long as we are trying to solve the problem, we can stay focused. We can keep our energy directed in the right direction. But when we're alone and on our way home or to different places, many have commented that that's the worst environment. And that has been our, dif our most difficult moment. And it's happened to uh, several of us. And so I would think that many that have come back to work today will find it therapeutic to rub shoulders, to talk about it, to work themselves through the difficulties uh, I've had many that have sent me uh, emails commenting on one thing or another over the last couple of days. I've received many phone calls. And for me personally, that's made a lot of difference. When I go home at night and sit there and think about the events, and I'm left with my own thoughts. What has been therapeutic to me is to get on my computer at home and have the opportunity to read some of these emails where people have expressed their thoughts and their concerns, given us support, helping us through difficult situations. And I'm through that's, sure that's true in many other cases. So it's, it varies with the individual. Things are getting better. Each day is better. Tomorrow is a day for us to pause and reflect. Tomorrow is a day for us to commemorate. In reality, it's today to, for us to celebrate the lives of seven heroes. And so we're going to pause and do that, and I think that day is going to be a tremendous benefit to many people, and we're looking forward to it. Okay, let's go to uh, NASA headquarters for a question, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Watson, with USA Today. When you first saw the videotape of the debris hitting the wing, was it immediately something of grave concern? Was it ever something of grave concern? I'm sure, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you to repeat that. It was, it was a little bit of static on the line, and if you'd repeat it, that would help me. Okay, I'm wondering, um, when, when did, when, when you and other managers saw debris hitting the wing, did you think it was a matter of grave concern? Was that something that really posed a lot of worries for you at that time? From my position in the uh, Mission Control Center, where I view the launch or the uh, flight control team um, controlling the reentry and talking with the crew, uh, I did not have any access to any physical evidence. 
Uh, our focus was looking at uh, navigation charts, radar tracking charts. Uh, our focus was uh, listening to the flight crew and the uh, flight control team. And uh, we did not have any physical evidence that would uh, lead us to believe that anything was wrong other than the, uh, the instrumentation dropouts that I talked to you about. But certainly when the instrumentation dropouts occurred, combined with loss of data and loss of tracking, uh, even then we weren't very anxious, but as time went on and that time grew without any communication from the crew, and that would be very unusual, then that was, very anxious, that was a very anxious time frame. And uh, you can only imagine how it felt when someone comes up to tell you that you've lost a vehicle in the crew. I don't think you can imagine that for us that sit there and work with these individuals. It's not something that I would want you to go through. It's not something I want my team to go through ever again. But we will recover from this. As I mentioned to you, we're getting stronger by the day. And just as the Phoenix rose from the ashes, we're going to do the same. We're going to find the problem. We're going to fix it. We're going to get back to space flight, human space flight. And we're going to have tremendous successes in the years ahead. And we're going to learn from these events. Our character will be stronger. Our resolve will be stronger. We'll be the better for this terrible tragedy. But we have work to do first. But we are getting better. Okay, that's all at headquarters. Let's go to the Marshall Space Flight Center, please. Kemp Falk with the Birmingham News. Uh, there's been discussions about a external tank foam striking the orbiter on previous missions. Uh, how many times, and could you give us specific missions, and was there ever a time when the debris was suspected of causing all or part of a tile to come off? This is not the first time that we have had um, debris generated from the external tank that has struck the uh, underside of the wing. It's not the first time that we have had um, debris from the bipod area of the tank come loose. Uh, it's happened uh, several times. I mentioned to you STS-112. I'm aware of some of the details of STS-50 where we had um, some debris shed from a similar area on the tank. And when we got the vehicle home, uh, we had some damage to the underside of the wing. It wasn't significant damage, but it, it was several inches long and maybe an inch or two wide and less than an inch deep. So you, you can understand some of our database and some of our thinking that when this has happened before, yes, it can impact the tile. Yes, it could take some of the coating off. Yes, it can even gouge out some of the tile. But it has never represented anything more than that. And so when you are in, you're an engineer or, or a manager and you have that database and you're faced with a similar type of circumstance on STS-107, you draw upon your experience. You draw upon the data available to you. You analyze what's new in the equation, and you, you make your best judgment on what the risk is to the vehicle and the crew. So yes, there have been some previous uh, occurrences. I don't have all those at my fingertips today. We are gathering that information, and, and uh, perhaps in, in future conferences, I can share that with you. After looking at all the reports from engineers that concluded there wouldn't be a problem, who, who was the final person who signed off on it? The person uh, with the authority to judge whether it's uh, 
represents a risk or not, ultimately is the chairman of the mission management team. However, I'm the accountable individual. Anything that happens at the mission management team, I am made aware of. And um, it's my personal commitment that I don't do anything that would jeopardize the crew or the vehicle. That means grounding the fleet, we'll do it. That means scrubbing the launch, we'll do it. Safety of the crew and the vehicle is absolutely paramount. So ultimately, it's my decision. And it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. If I believe it's not a safe thing to do, then we won't proceed. In this case, I did not chair the mission management team. 